Open in Liberty Fund Colloquia and a reviewer for the Journal of Markets and Morality. Ferguson teaches political philosophy, game theory, and business ethics. She also facilitates the course on economic federalism that accompanies the Liberty and Ethics Center's Spring Conference. In addition, Dr. Ferguson coordinates a collection of liberty-oriented faculty from mid-sized Midwestern universities, which aims to engage with constitutional law and economics at the faculty, undergraduate, and high school levels. Dr. Ferguson received her Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy from Lindenwood University and her PhD in Philosophy from St. Louis University. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson, for uh, being a, one of our distinguished panelists this afternoon. Thank you for having me. And, uh, and now I would like to introduce our second panelist, Dr. Anthony Bradley, who is a professor of religious studies at the King's College in New York City, where he also serves as director for the Center for the Study of Human Flourishing. Since 2002, Dr. Bradley has been a research fellow at the Acton Institute. Dr. Bradley holds Bachelor of Science in Biology Sciences from Clemson University, a Master of Divinity from Covenant Theological Seminary, a Master's in Ethics and Society from Fordham University, and a Doctor of Philosophy from Westminster, or Westminster, excuse me, Theological Seminary. As a research fellow, Dr. Bradley lectures at colleges, universities, business organizations, conferences, and churches throughout the US and abroad. His writings on religious and cultural issues have been published in a variety of journals, including the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Washington Examiner, the Detroit News, and World Magazine. Dr. Bradley is called upon by members of the broadcast media for comment on current issues and has appeared on NPR, CNN, Fox News, amongst others. others. He studies and writes on issues of race in America, mass incarceration and over criminalization, youth, family, welfare, education, and ethics. His dissertation explores the intersection of black liberation theology and economics. From 2005 to 2009, Dr. Bradley was assistant professor of systemic theology and ethics at Covenant uh, Theological Seminary in St. Louis, where he also directed the Francis Schaeffer Institute. Dr. Bradley is the author of several books, including The Political Economy of Liberation, Thomas Sowell and James Cohn on the Black Experience, Black and Tired, Essays on Race, Politics, Culture, and International Development, Liberating Black Theology, The Bible and the Black Experience in America, Ending Over Criminalization and Mass Incarceration, and co-editor of John Rawls and Christian Social Engagement, Justice as Unfairness. Thank you very much, Dr. Bradley, for being one of our distinguished panelists this afternoon. I'm, I'm delighted to be here, thank you. So we're gonna get right into it, and we have a few prepared questions that we're going to ask our panelists, but the viewers will also have an opportunity uh, to submit comments, observations, and questions uh, if we have time toward the end of the, um, um, the discussion, we will present those to our panelists um, for response. So um, we're gonna start off with Anthony and the first question um, is for, for Anthony. Um, Dr. Bradley, the George Floyd protests and Black Lives Matters rallies across the country were particularly intense this summer. What are some of the issues activists from black communities are hoping to address as it relates to race and policing? Yeah, thanks uh, so much for having me. I'm, I'm delighted to be a participant in this, in this conversation. Um, uh, you know, so, so much has happened over the last uh, few months and there's been this convergence of multiple conversations and I think what, what essentially happened in Minneapolis was the conversion of our country's legacy of wrestling with race issues, uh, but also our struggles with the criminal justice system. 
And those, those uh, collided in, in Minneapolis. And so what people are actually hearing uh, much from the black communities across the country are opportunities and invitations for us to address on the one hand, issues of, of police brutality, uh, over criminalization, the force of the state. Uh, and then secondly, the ways in which we have uh, and, and, and need to deal with some of our uh, histories and, and complications uh, regarding race. What's particularly interesting in this context, though, is I want to focus really on this on the strain of overcriminalization and mass incarceration. There is has been massive interest in criminal justice reform, and some of that has has really overlapped. It overlaps and really presses in on uh, some of the issues related to uh, police reform, which I'll, I'll talk about in just in just a moment. Uh, most people are probably aware uh, uh, that we have a, a mass incarceration, call it, call it mass incarceration, I call it more an over-criminalization uh, problem. And in 2010, uh, Michelle Alexander uh, wrote a book called The New Jim Crow, a Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. And that was really the introduction for many people to some of the struggles that we have uh, today in the criminal justice system and the sort of explosive numbers, the high numbers of, of men and women who are currently incarcerated. Uh, the good news is that since about 2008, 2009, those numbers have been declining, uh, but we still have about two and a half million people uh, currently in, incarcerated. Now, what's interesting about this, this discourse is that it's, it's important to remember, I wanna highlight just a few things because that new Jim Crow thesis really pushes that this is a drug war driven sort of race driven uh, problem and I want to submit that it's actually worse than that uh, it's not it wasn't driven by drugs uh, if you look at incarceration rates in the mid uh, 1970s uh, those were primarily driven by uh, violent crime and property crime uh, drug arrests uh, really only accounted for about 20% in most states of that, of that increase. I also would, would recommend and, and submit that it really wasn't driven by, by race. For example, when you look at cities like Washington, D.C., where the black middle class was in control of the criminal justice system, uh, the black middle class was just as punitive as other municipalities across the country. Uh, what we tend to overlook is that most people are incarcerated in state prisons, not federal prisons. And so about 90% of incarcerated men and women in prison today are in state facilities, which means that this is a local problem, not a federal problem. This isn't really a national problem. This is a state and county and, and local city uh, uh, problem. Uh, so, so, oh, and, and, and by the way, it's also not an issue of private prisons. Private prisons only account for about 8% of all the prisons uh, that we have in this, in this country. What we do find, however, and this is really the point I'd like, I'd like to raise, is that we have a history in this country of using the criminal justice system and using the state to manage and control poor people. And, and one of the ways in which the state's been, been increasingly aggressive is at managing the poor. And so what we saw in, Fer in, in well, not yet, well, in, in Ferguson, uh, but also in Minneapolis is how the state uses the police to manage the people we've been managing since the 1900s, which are lower income populations, particularly in urban areas. Before World War II, those, those same communities were over-policed. There was a lot of aggressive police action in those communities, but they, it was immigrants, right? Immigrants from uh, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, from, from Poland, uh, from Italy. By the time we got to the 1950s and 60s, those same communities were highly populated by African Americans. And that same over emphasis on controlling the underclass and using the state to do so really exploded the ways in which prosecutors in particular were incentivized to open the door wide open 
to lock up uh, what, what one theorist calls the rabble. And these are the people that we don't want to be around and we don't want our kids to be around. And so what we saw in Minneapolis, I believe, is, is uh, when, when, the, when the police saw George Floyd, they didn't necessarily see a black man, but they saw the rabble. Uh, and, and, and these are the people that in the criminal justice discussion, uh, we actually need to talk about in terms of how we use the state, how we use police and how we use criminal law to deal with those who are uh, in, the, in the underclass uh, when, they, when they break the social contract. Uh, middle class people have opportunities to get really expensive lawyers. Uh, prosecutors tend to leave us alone because of that. Uh, there's about 4,500 criminal laws that, that any one of us could be charged with at any time. And the difference between why someone like myself won't be uh, incarcerated, won't, won't be convicted, and someone else has much more to do with their class uh, than their race. So, so we saw this convergence in Minneapolis, uh, not just on sort of race and criminal uh, and, and, and overcriminalization, we also saw the ways in which we've always used the state and used policing to manage those people that we consider underclass uh, and, and, and the rabble. Might need to unmute yourself there, Ron. There you go. Yeah, thank you. The host had to unmute me. Sorry. Um, I thank you very much, um, Anthony, for that response. Dr. Ferguson, do you have anything that you would like to add? Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> that's so insightful. And there's a lot of, um, I think, mythology around this issue. So it's really helpful to just drill down on the actual data and see what's going on. Um, I'm not nearly as much of an expert as Dr. Bradley is on criminal justice reform, but I will say that one of the things that has really stunned me is the arbitrariness of, the, of uh, aggressive prosecution. Just how much control the prosecutor has over what they want to go after, what they don't, how they want to construct the, um, the process. And uh, I don't think a lot of people necessarily think that. And I, the other thing that I think people easily overlook is that the police are being asked to enforce all of these laws, which puts them in a position to have constant negative contact with community members. Um, and that just builds that feeling of distrust. And so there's something bigger and more structural going on than just this cop or that cop and his feelings about uh, you know, one race or another. It's, it's, it's much, much bigger than that. So I, I agree. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. On to the first question for you, Dr. Ferguson. We've discussed the need for reform of our criminal justice system at the level of government, but we also know that there are real issues of poverty and lack of opportunity that are tied up with high crime rates and tough neighborhoods. Even as a reformed criminal justice system wouldn't entirely solve these deeper problems, is there anything we can do to address the root issues and not just the symptoms? Thank you for that question. Um, so I do think that there are things that we can do, but we have some mindset problems. Uh, just the way we tend to construct these things in our minds that we have to sort of undergo a paradigm shift. And so um, let me just address two of those and then I'm gonna talk about what I really think the solution is. Um, the first one is, uh, it has to do with Dunbar's number. If, if you guys know the term Dunbar's number, that's kind of the number of people you can have, like one human being can have stable relationships with, just given our size of our brain, you know, and how many people we can spend time with. And they say it's about 150. Uh, and then of course, who I can be very close to is maybe only three or five, uh, who I can have in my circle of friends, maybe 12 or 15. And that's about average for human beings. And what that means is that we, there's a natural scale for community building, and the natural scale is gonna be at the level of the neighborhood. Not the nation, not the state, not even the city, the neighborhood block that you live on. Um, if you're gonna build something positive. The second mindset issue that I wanna address is sort of this notion that there's, we might call it one thingism. 
the idea that there's this one thing that needs to be solved and it depends on which side you're on but it's always one thing so uh so progressives may emphasize money um uh, conservatives might emphasize family structure etc and the idea is if we could just fix this one thing uh we would solve the problem but the truth is is that people who are in persistent poverty i don't mean something temporary but something persistent um that's usually a very complicated situation there's a lot of things going on at the same time and some national policy that where you push a button isn't going to uh isn't going to solve that that complex of issues and so we've got to resist that mindset and uh think about the whole set of issues that may be going on educationally uh with you know violence in the neighborhood opportunities etc and so the real uh, stable solution for tough neighborhoods, I believe, has to be holistic and organic. Centralized policies can remove obstacles. Uh, criminal justice reform is a good example, we, not at the nation, but at the state or city. You can remove uh, very difficult obstacles out of the way, but that's not the same as building something or repairing something that's been lost. And so when we look at healing, um, a destabilized neighborhood, and I'm thinking of a neighborhood where, you know, more than 20% than of the homes, for instance, are abandoned, that's going to be a fairly destabilized neighborhood, then you, you can't do sort of quick fix, push button, top down solutions. It's got to be local, person to person, decentralized. So a couple of the classic works on this idea are uh, the book When Helping Hurts uh, by Fickert and the book uh, Toxic Charity by Robert Lupton. Uh, these are both community builders on the ground talking about their own experiences of the way that our philanthropic models are set up. And the, the observation is that they're set up to undermine the dignity and the personhood of people who are in poverty. Um, and so there's a couple of basic principles here, and really we could apply this to public or private. They're talking about private, but I think it's, there's a lot of similarities. One of them is that it's imposed from the outside. So I have a solution. I think I know what's best. I'm going to impose this from the outside. Then our neighbors are not consulted as to what they would like to see happen in their communities, not consulted about what ideas they have. The assumption seems to be that they don't have a contribution to make. Um, we might call this a kind of savior complex. And we've set up a system in which that makes it kind of a full-time job to be poor. So you, you go from thing to thing where a philanthropic group or the government has set up separate compartmentalized programs to deal with this or that thing. And a poor person spends their days navigating these systems while having to present themselves as having nothing to offer. That's, that's how the systems are set up. None of these systems are set up as a dignifying exchange of goods and services. And so this philanthropic model reinforces a savior mindset on one hand and a poverty mindset on the other. And it's a vicious cycle in which uh, very few people are actually emerging from poverty. They may be surviving, but they're not emerging. And we have to look at the incentives, look at the way we set up our programs uh, when we report, for instance, to donors. We've helped this many hundreds of people this year. Um, so the bigger the numbers, the better, right? Um, so I want to flip that totally on its head. And I'm going to use your, it's your lucky day, Ron, because I'm going to talk about Love the Lou. <laughs> I'm going to use them as my example, just to give you guys something concrete, but this is happening in Atlanta with focused community strategies. It's happening in Chicago. There are other groups doing the same types of things. So my friend Lucas Rugley is the, is the director of Love the Lou in St. Louis. He lives on Enright Avenue. He, he moved there. So he lives there and he's been there for 10 years. This is in the Van Avenger neighborhood. Most of the programming his staff uh, runs occurs on Enright and he invites education and business mentors to Enright. So they come to the neighborhood rather than asking his neighbors to spend their days going from this food pantry to that government office to that job training over there, his neighbors are surrounded by the resources that his organization invites in. The number one need in the neighborhood is for an organic connection to a job and the mentoring to grow into that job. So neighbors, including high school students, have job opportunities in the lawn business, tending to community gardens, 
Uh, for instance, the gardening starts at 14. If you do well there, you go to small engine and woodworking. Uh, you, if you do there, you can move on to the small business, which is the profitable farmer's market that is run on Saturdays uh, during the summer in, on Enright Avenue. And uh, from there, Love the Lou is connected to apprenticeships and internships at outside businesses, but they know everyone in the neighborhood knows each other very well and can help the students find what fits their talents and their personality. Uh, neighbors are also able, able to rent to own rehabbed houses on Enright, and neighbors work with one another and with police to regulate crime. Uh, small groups, tutoring, all of that happens on and right. Love the Lou also supports entrepreneurship. Here's a shout out to Michelle. She's the maker of Pimped Out Pickles. They are delicious. And we've got them in every grocery store in St. Louis. Uh, Tiffany has opened her own daycare. Um, last year, Tawana became the owner of a house on Enright that Love the Lou volunteers had helped to rehab. And she makes payments to Love the Lou. Now, little did we know when Tawana got that house that we were gonna be in a COVID crisis. Now Tawana's house is the food pantry, not some place over there, right? Tawana's house right there, someone that everyone in the community knows and trusts. She's feeding 125 families a week. She's got $6,000 worth of groceries going through, but it's different from just a handout because these are people who she has relationships with. She can talk to them about what's going on in their lives from day to day. And she has become what we call in Love the Lou, a person of peace uh, in the neighborhood because she's like an anchor of stability. Um, and she creates a vision for people that they can see where they can be headed. And, uh, you know, it's important to note that the food pantry, for instance, just happened. You know, it's, it's not something that anybody had planned. It organically arose because of the needs that were coming along with COVID and uh, programming was shifted over and, and put towards that. So after 10 years, the Enright neighborhood is a stable community, one block at a time, outsiders invited in, not the other way around, long-term commitment to the restoration of the neighborhood. Today, out of 50 students that started with Love the Lou, 45 have stayed in the program, which means they've avoided gangs and they're finishing school. Crime is way down. Love the Lou is only now, after 10 years, taking on the Kingsway West neighborhood. That's the next project. And this is exactly how Lupton did it, four neighborhoods in 40 years in Atlanta. And I think we can sometimes be sort of intimidated by this model because it looks like it takes a long time and it takes a lot of commitment, and that is true. But let's also think about the fact that there are 16,000 nonprofits in St. Louis investing one and a half billion dollars per year into the city. If some of those, if only some of those would shift their energy, time and resources to this relational model that, that is addressing one gr small group of people uh, that you get to know very well, as opposed to trying to do a little bit for a lot of people, which uh, is feeding a bad cycle. And I think we see groups like the United Way or the Urban League trying to take this holistic approach. They know that there's a lot of problems going on at once and that you need to kind of attack them all together, but they always want to be big. And, and I'm not blaming them. I think we've set the system up to incentivize this and donors have set it up to incentivize this. And so because they want to be big, they end up missing out on the relational side. Um, and you just have to think about the way we get grants, the way numbers are reported, the way donors um, want to hear stories of, of helplessness and neediness instead of hearing and being incentivized by stories of somebody who's worth investing in because they have talents and gifts that they could be developing. It's a very different paradigm. So I'd really like us to flip our mindset to just completely surrounding individuals with the resources they need to emerge from poverty within their communities one block at a time. Thank you much, um, very much, Rachel. Um, the Lou has another admirer. I love the Lou now, so. Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Good. Dave, uh, uh, Dr. Bradley, was there anything that you would like to add or, or comment or um, mention? No. Yeah, I think I think that that focus on, on on poverty is the core of our problem. I think what we 
what we tend to do in, in America is conflate poverty and race. And so many of the issues that we think are sort of issues of race are actually issues of poverty. And it's obscured because we see large groups of one type of, uh, one group of people in, in urban neighborhoods. Uh, and, and so for me, the question is, and, and this is part of the paradigm shift, what can we do to introduce as many opportunities for economic and political liberty are for those people who live in poor neighborhoods, just like the rest of us who are middle class and upper class exercise opportunities for political and economic liberty. So we need to expand liberty, expand economic and political liberty, uh, not just for those of, of the privileged classes, but also those who are in low income neighborhoods and give them the framework that they can have agency uh, to solve the, the, the issues in their local communities. So absolutely right. Thank you very much, Dr. Bradley. Dr. Smith, is there anything that you would like to add? Uh, well, thank you for asking. Uh, am I unmuted? Yes. Yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, I would like to ask um, uh, Anthony a question and uh, Rachel, and you too, Ron, if you're interested, but uh, so a lot of the, uh, you know, the protests have been about policing and uh, there's a woman named Patrice uh, Con Colors, uh, who was uh, one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. And she wrote a uh, biography of, about uh, her and her uh, siblings growing up in Van Nuys. And so she really does, she says it's, uh, it's not, it wasn't a problem of poverty uh, and it was a problem of race, uh, but maybe there's a door number three and it was something else besides. But basically what she says is it was a problem of policing and she's not, she didn't say too little policing. She didn't say too much policing. She didn't say defund the police. What she said was that the police didn't come from the neighborhood and the police were, uh, were like an occupying army that treated anybody over the age of 12 as a presumptively violent criminal. And so what she says is that's what destroyed her brothers, that's what destroyed her friends, uh, that's what made them, that's what gutted them of aspiration of hopes and dreams is that they felt like uh, authority uh, had judged them to be guilty just uh, for nothing, just for being for being black or for being poor, for being over the age of twelve, they they felt like they had been uh, that the world had judged them to be uh, dangerous and unwelcome. That mm -hmm. was the idea. So does that does that fit with what you're saying? I think it does. But if, yeah, if you have anything to say, no, that that actually fits with the narrative that at least the one I've been proposing is that what we've done is we've, we've classified a group of people, and I get this from John Irwin's book, The Jail, which came out in 1984. We, we reclassify these people, I'm using his word, as rabble. And it doesn't matter if they are black rabble, Latino rabble, uh, Chicano rabble, lower class, white trash, redneck rabble, okay, whatever the rabble group is, and then we send in the police to keep them contained. And, and in inner cities, what we do, what we've done is we've sent in the police to keep them contained in the inner cities. And so in one sense, she, she's exactly right. Now, what's also interesting though, is that if you look at the whole history of policing, uh, it's not necessarily the case that you would get better policing from people from the neighborhood. In fact, uh, sometimes people from, from their own communities tend to be more harsh with people within their own uh, uh, ethnic groups. But what really matters is, is, is how one views the humanity of people that they see on the street. 
and whether or not those people have inherent human dignity, whether or not, whether or not you see them as having agency, as, whether or not you see them as, 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 as men and women that have opportunities to, to have agency and express economic and political liberty. Do you see them as, as potential participants in the common good or not? And the verdict when we move into some communities, whether it be a, a trailer park in Appalachia or an inner city in Chicago is no. They do not. And then when we reclassify them, it actually gives the state permission to be overly harsh and overly punitive. And prosecutors, because they, they are incentivized to, to lock as many of these people up as possible, that's exactly what they do. I mean, you know, between 94, 90% of all, of all cases plead out and the prosecutor makes that decision and the prosecutor has every incentive uh, to clear as many cases as he or she wants. And it's not in her neighborhood, right? So the people that are making decisions about policing and about criminal law, about the statutes, don't live in their own communities. One last point is that when, when the judge and the prosecutor and the legislators are actually from the communities, the criminal laws themselves that police are sworn to enforce are actually less punitive. So she is right with, with, with respect to there being some spatial mismatch problems where we tend to be overly punitive about the community over there because that's not where our children are. When it's our own community, we tend to be far more reasonable in the criminal laws that we uh, uh, construct and how we actually use police to enforce them. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have a ton to add, I, I, I guess, maybe what I would say is I wouldn't want to get caught up in one thing as either. And so I actually agree with Dr. Bradley entirely on problems with policing. Um, but it's also true that that sense of a feeling of a lack of agency can come from feeling like you have no economic opportunity as well. And so all of those things are going on at the same time issues with family structure going on at the same time. That's a huge temptation of the gangs, right? And so these are all things that are happening at the same time and we just have to sort of live with the complexity of that and just admit that there's a lot going on, which is one of the reasons why I'm always saying that on the political side, yes, you have to work on criminal justice reform. But if you ask, well, what can I do? I'm not a politician or I'm not, you know, a, a person who writes about policy or anything like that. Well, you know, call, call me if you want to help with Love the Lou. I'll get you down there and we'll get you planting some tomatoes and you'll get to know some people. Um, and so fighting that a singular mindset, I think is important. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I just have one brief comment and that's, and we all know this, that law enforcement officers and police um, stations do not operate in a vacuum. And so when we talk about justice reform, um, it's not just law enforcement officers and prosecutors, but it's also the judges, the jurors, the probation officers, parole officers, as well as the prisons that need to uh, be examined. And I know that there are two organizations that I've worked with in the past when I was on the bench. One was the Center for Court Innovation in New York, and the other was the National Center for State Courts. And they've worked very closely with the various players within the justice system to ensure that problem solving justice, community courts, community policing, uh, were the types of institutions that work collaboratively with community organizations so that you had a variety of stakeholders at the table like uh, Dr. Ferguson was, was when she was speaking about Love the Lou and how um, um, different uh, uh, groups um, and different stakeholders came together. Within the justice system, there are models where you'll see police, faith-based community, educational institutions, small businesses, community organizers, uh, politicians, you know, working together uh, at the systems level uh, to address root causes. And so um, that's the minor comment or observation that I would make regarding um, the, the question that you presented, Dave. And thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to share. Thank you. Um, yeah. With that, I'd like to 
go on to the second question that I wanted to ask Anthony. And um, that question is, how do we move forward? And uh, are there any helpful approaches that might allow us to effectively address concerns in local communities regarding race in the criminal justice system? Great question. Thanks for thanks for asking that. Uh, you know, it, this is this, this is sort of part of the the overall theme, is that the best solutions are actually going to be the local ones, and and if if I could encourage people to use their imagination, it would be instead of imagining what we should be doing nationally, to really be thinking about what can be done in my zip code. Uh, what can be done in my county? What can be done in my city? What's happening in my state legislature? Because that's actually where these decisions are made that really affect uh, the underclass and, and those who are uh, under underprivileged. One of the things that I've, I've been I've been pointing out recently is that is that part of that that collision on the race narrative and the policing narrative is that. I think black, the Black Lives Matter uh, protesting, the George Floyd protesting, all the racial protesting we're seeing today, the, removement, the, the removing of Confederate monuments, et cetera, that all of those things are actually a proxy for work that we did not do after the civil rights movement ended, after Jim Crow ended. We, we actually should have addressed these sorts of issues of race in our, in lo, in our local communities uh, immediately following the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And so we never did anything to help us transition from the period of Jim Crow to one of economic and political liberty. And there was still some resistance to that. And the term for that is, is called transitional justice. And that's something uh, that's been uh, championed by the legal community but it, it really hasn't been popularized uh, yet. And I'm, I've sort of joined a, a team of scholars to help people understand that it's probably transitional justice uh, that's going to help us address these issues uh, locally. Uh, just by way of a quick definition, transitional justice consists of judicial and non-judicial measures implemented in order to redress legacies of, of human rights abuses. And, and the leading variable in transitional justice is a rule of law. So it wants to really uh, encourage and advance the rule of law as a way to, to restore communities to peace and prosperity and using the rule of law to set the conditions for human flourishing right? When you have the rule of law, what do you get? You get property rights, right? You get agency, you get dignity, because everyone's treated exactly the same. And, and transitional justice in our, is an opportunity for us to use the rule of law to address the issues that we have really never addressed in terms of the legacies, uh, particularly of Jim Crow. The, the, the recognition and appreciation of, of human dignity is crucial in this conversation because of the social contracts that affirm the rule of law and give us the framework for practicing reciprocal neighborly care. That is, the rule of law provides the, the scaffolding to allow us to care for our neighbors and to do that freely. And so actually, I would say do that with joy and with enthusiasm because, here's why, because the investment that you make in your neighbors are the sorts of investments that you can actually see because they impact, they benefit not only you, but they also benefit your neighbor. So there's a, there's a, uh, there, there's, there's, there's wonderful reciprocation that happens locally where everyone sees that our communities are, are improving because we're helping each other and we're helping our communities thrive together. Now, in, in order for this to happen, I think local cities are going to have to bring transitional justice to reforming their police departments, in particular reforming how policing is done uh, in their local communities so that we can, we can sort of restore uh, the rule of law. So transitional justice in communities really does uh, allow for the, the 
advancement of the rule of law for robust social growth and development and prosperity and thriving and liberty. So I have seven quick things that I think, I think cities can do uh, to really advance transitional justice uh, within these communities. The first is cities should prosecute uh, uh, alleged perpetrators of uh, police violence and brutality. Uh, again, using the rule of law, we need to bring people to justice who violated human rights. Uh, secondly, cities should encourage uh, formal investigations of human rights by police by using truth commissions and other bodies. So to give citizens and communities opportunities to tell stories of what actually happened, how their rights have been violated, and to put that on record. We have to get these things on record so that, so that our, our pursuits of justice are about particular issues, not justice in the abstract. You want, you want these remedies to be about things that are, that are uh, specific. A third, uh, victims should be acknowledged and they should be given opportunities to have any, any remedies uh, introduced to repair any damage that's been done in the past. Uh, fourthly, a city should implement vetting policies and sanctions to remove people that are corrupt uh, from uh, decision-making authority in local communities. Uh, five, a city should support official programs and initiatives that, that remember past victims, remember those injustices, but also to educate people about what happens when the rule of law implodes and it's the rule of men. Uh, and, and to keep that history uh, fresh so that we respect the sorts of institutions that allow for uh, human flourishing. Uh, six, and this really brings us back to the ways in which we've ha been having this discussion today, a city should support and respect traditional and religious approaches regarding past violations and activate civil society so, uh, institutions like churches and nonprofits to facilitate peace and human flourishing and reconciliation and thriving, right? We need to get all the community stakeholders from all uh, aspects of a local community together to help think about ways, the, the, the ways in which they can work together to address some of those histories. And lastly, here's seven, uh, sh a city should engage in police reform to support the rule of law uh, restore public trust in policing and promote constitutional rights and support uh, good governance. And that means, by the way, radically reforming how policing is done and radically reforming the ways in which we think about inviting other civil society institutions to help us maintain peace and justice and to advance uh, the common good. Here's the question. Here's the question we have to wrestle with. Do we have to throw someone in jail every time they do something bad? Right? Because what we do in this country, if we're mad at people, we just lock them up. And, and the invitation is, can we use the other institutions of civil society to address some of the issues when there's breakdowns in the social contract that do not involve the criminal justice system and, and policing? But that's a conversation that has to happen at the local level. Because the issues that led these communities to imploding in the various ways in which they did are local narratives. So I'm from Atlanta. What happened in Atlanta's history is different even than Birmingham, than in Tucson, than in Compton, and Chicago, and Detroit, and, and um, uh, in uh, Goldsboro, North Carolina, right? So, so local communities really are invited within this framework to use the rule of law uh, to allow for the sorts of, of remedies that allow people to flourish and thrive. And we need more of that and less of a focus on the, on the magic that might happen uh, some would say from Washington DC. I think, I think we need to sort of reimagine, re-engage our citizen participation and pay attention to our city councils, our county commissions, and what happens in our state legislature. Thank you, Dr. Bradley, for that answer. Um, and I'm um, very 
glad to hear you mention alternatives to incarceration. Uh, in this country, we have a significant number of homeless people, veterans, and those suffering from mental illness who are incarcerated for quality of life crimes. And uh, your suggestion that there be alternatives to incarceration for these low life offen offenders and offenses and partnerships with community organizations that can provide services to address the root causes is uh, well received. And I know that there are communities uh, working diligently and I'm sure that Love the Lou um, probably even has a partnership with um, the local justice system to provide either ex-offenders or those who've committed quality to quality of life crimes opportunity to do community service or perform some other function in lieu of incarceration. Um, Dr. Ferguson, did you have anything you wanted to, to add? You know, actually, um, I think transitional justice is so important. And uh, part of the institutional memory piece is gonna come up in the next question anyway. So if we wanna just move on to okay. uh, that, I'll, I'll weave that in, yeah. All right. So, so the next question is, uh, we call this talk creating a better future, but there are still such gaping inequalities of wealth between blacks and whites in America. Is it really fair to ask black Americans to be hopeful about economic progress? Okay, so um, as I was saying, I think this relates directly to the point about how we remember what occurred and uh, that's part of doing justice to our history. Um, if you have time, uh, you could read this book, The Color of Law, by Richard Rothstein, um, who goes over a lot of the uh, history of zoning and FHA redlining. Um, if you don't have a lot of time and you want to just, this is going to sound ridiculous, but if any of you remember VeggieTales, Bob the Tomato from VeggieTales, <laughs> that guy's name is Phil Vischer, and he did a uh, excellent 18 minute long uh, video, which you can just Google, um, you know, Bob the Tomato racism or something like that, uh, where he takes a look at the structural uh, problems that occurred historically, everything from convict leasing to redlining and everything in between, and he does a really good job of, of saying it all very quickly. Um, so in under 20 minutes, you can get kind of a summary of that. It's incredibly important that we acknowledge this. It doesn't explain everything about the disparities between whites and blacks, but it certainly explains a lot. And just, just admitting that that's what happened, I think is really important. Um, on the other hand, I think it's incredibly important that we stop perpetuating the stereotype of associating uh, being black with being poor. So if you go back to 1940, 89% of the black population is living below the poverty line. By 1960, it had dropped to 41%. So half of America's black population emerged from poverty in the 20 years between 1940 and 1960. And of course, that's census data, which is the reason we draw the line there. But now, are there some, are there some steps forward in terms of, of race in those years? Yes, uh, some uh, in the Army, for instance, in um, the Brown v. Board case. But uh, surely that's not, that doesn't explain 50% uh, emerging from poverty. So what does? And I think you can make a really good case, at least the correlation is very high, between that period and just a period of extreme, extremely good economic growth. Uh, you just have a lot of economic growth happening at this time. And everybody is getting richer. Uh, but, you know, when a poor person gets a little richer, it means more to them than when a person who's already rich gets a little richer. <laughs> and so it can make a huge difference. Um, when we experience downturns, uh, uh, economic downturns, on the other hand, uh, you know, Mr. We, I think we tend to kind of have a weird sort of division in our minds between the economy and people. And we think of the economy as Wall Street or something like that. Um, 
but that's not true. I, it, people are, are the economy. And Mr. Wall Street will probably be okay even after a recession uh, or he'll bounce back pretty quickly. Uh, for those on the margins, no. Recessions last much longer for them. It's devastating to lose your job. Um, so economic growth all by itself makes a huge difference. Now, in the mid 70s, by the mid 70s, we'd actually gotten the black poverty rate to 30%. But then it sort of stopped uh, going down and it actually, we actually went backwards a little bit for a little while. Well, what's going on in the 70s? Stagflation, high interest rates, right? It's a time of extremely slow uh, economic growth. And so the poverty rate correlates with that. Now we're down to 20% in the black population. That means, and, and the white poverty rate is about half of that. Okay, and there's studies that have shown the vast majority of black people in America today consider themselves middle class. Most of them grew up that way. Um, of people who are government dependent and dealing with persistent poverty, the vast majority are white and always have been. So what's the picture that I have in my mind of a poor person? I think that's a question we have to ask ourselves. And it's interesting when you think about this, why general economic growth is not sort of a plank in our, in our ideas of social justice, because it's, a, it's a, the most effective way to get people out of poverty. Um, I think another reason that it gets overlooked is because it's dispersed, right? So if I hand someone money, I see that they got money through a program, say. But if I participate in a healthy economy and someone is able to get a job because it's available when it wasn't before, uh, I don't necessarily see that, it's dispersed. And so um, the economic way of thinking, we might, I, I'd love to refer everybody to the essay, What is Seen and What is Unseen by Frederick Bastiat. You can just Google it and read it what is seen and what is unseen, because what Bastiat says is that when it comes to economics, we're so prone to only see the concentrated benefit or the concentrated cost, but we lose track of the dispersed benefits and dispersed costs. And the, the economic way of thinking is to pay attention to those dispersed costs. And so I think we need to, um, notice that we have made an incredible amount of progress on poverty due to simply growing our economy um, uh, in general, and that we need to be really sensitive to that as an important plank in any efforts that we make to, uh, to deal with uh, poverty as it continues. Thank you very much. Um, one thing real quick I wanted to um, ask you as a follow-up question, um, Dr. Ferguson, to the um, uh, to the wealth inequalities, is um, do you see a correlation between the wealth inequalities and the educational inequalities or the healthcare inequalities in the African American communities as it compares to the white communities? Yeah, absolutely. And so this actually ties back into transitional justice as well when uh, Dr. Bradley was referring to the traditional uh, and religious civil society institutions. I think that our education system uh, works okay for many people, uh, but clearly does not work well in our inner cities. And um, if you look at the Pew Research data, people of color, both Black and Latino, are in the in an overwhelming majority are in favor of educational freedom. And this recent Espinoza case, for instance, that just happened, we'll see how it plays out in the courts um, for uh, other opportunities. But the I, I just wrote an article a couple weeks ago on the bridge called uh, John Lewis Learned Good Trouble from the Black Church. And I argued in that article that the Black Church is beautifully placed to be running inner city schools. 
Um, and if funding followed students rather than going into systems, you would see a renaissance. I truly believe in education. And one of the reasons for that is because you'd have different models for different situations. As we said before, it's local. And it depends on sometimes even the specific child, right? You can have children with difficult situations at home. You can have a different child who just has uh, you know, a learning disorder. There's all sorts of things that we run into in education. And having different models where students are able to find what they need for themselves, I think is incredibly important. And we have, we are spending an incredible amount of money on education, something like on average $15,000 per student per year. Uh, but a lot of it's going to administrators, uh, a lot of it's going to bureaucracy, and it could be spent in a, and allocated in a far more effective way if we would allow, I think, choice and agency on the part of, of parents. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Bradley, was there anything that you would like to add? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just say this really quick because I'm, I'm eager to get to people's questions. Um, you know, what, what's, what, what we see particularly in this question, I'm always frustrated because this sort of white black comparisons rarely control for class. And, and what, what we find, and this is something that, that William Julius Wilson really did a good job of in the 1990s, is really explain how the black middle class has really done well. Uh, it's really been the, the black underclass uh, that we see really stuck in these really in, in these sort of broken broken systems. So when you talk about correlations between race and healthcare disparities, education disparities, et cetera, um, the black middle class thrives in the same way that the white middle class does because they invest they're invested in very similar institutions, marriage fatherhood, uh, the Kiwanis Club, the Boy Scouts, uh, good schools, the church, et cetera. When you compare sort of the, sort of the uh, underprivileged blacks with underprivileged whites in say Appalachia, Arkansas, South Alabama, you see the exact same trajectories in terms of their schooling, uh, healthcare outcomes, uh, uh, et cetera. And that may be why the image of poverty in the 1940s was actually rural whites as, as opposed to urban blacks. And, and that, that image has been, has been shifted. It's a chicken and egg discussion. Is it a race thing or a class thing? Uh, if you look at the history of how the country has, has related to poor people, I'm going to argue that it's been class because it's been that way uh, in the white community since uh, the, the mid 18th century. What we saw is that that was exacerbated by race and racism. It made, it made the sort of class distinctions uh, even, even that much worse. So focusing on, on economic and political liberty uh, for, for, for uh, the truly disadvantaged, both in inner cities and, and rural Americas will, will really do us all uh, a social good. Thank you very much, Dr. Bradley. Dr. Smith, um, at this time, I, we've received several questions from our audience. Uh, would you like to um, ask our panelists a few of the questions that have been presented? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, let's, let's do that. Let's jump in. So. Uh, uh, but uh, Ron, um, first, something that uh, I've heard you say, and you've uh, credited Frederick Douglass with saying this, you've said it's easier to grow strong children than to repair broken men. So part of what uh, I think uh, Anthony and Rachel in different ways were both getting at is, uh, is that we're, we're at a, a stage where we have to ask, what is strength? What is it to be a strong child? And, um, and at least, uh, I, I think it's something about believing in yourself. It's something 
I think I've heard all of you say this. I've heard you say this for sure, Ron. It's something like accepting as a joyful challenge the possibility that this world can be better off with you than without you. Um, so I guess I have a question though. Is, is, is there a stigma associated with teaching kids that they have a lot to look forward to, that they're not broken, they don't ever have to be broken, that the next generation, including them, can take humanity to a different level and it'll be partly because of them. And as a matter of fact, that's what's expected of them. Is there, uh, is there a, is that what they need to be taught? And, um, and is there a way to teach them that? Uh, can we, can we honestly say that to them? Can we make that true of the world that they're growing into responsibility for? So I'll, uh, that, that's one idea. Yeah, can I, can I, I'll, I'll just address that really quickly. Uh, my, my, my mom spent her entire career uh, teaching special education in inner city Atlanta uh, and, and raised in Jim Crow, North Carolina. My dad's from Jim Crow, Alabama. And education was a massive part of, of, of formation in the black community by black teachers to black students. And there was always, we were always raised to sort of see ourselves as the hope for the future, right? Um, and I, th I, think, I think what happens in, in a lot of inner cities is that that message is being communicated by many teachers, by relatives, but it's undermined. Uh, it's by all these other things, right? It's undermined by personal trauma, it's undermined by violence, it's undermined by physical sexual abuse. Uh, it's undermined by the absence of, of economic opportunities in their local communities. And those messages really do, uh, uh, you know, sort of take on flesh when a child can imagine the space in which that can happen. But when you're looking in your neighborhood and you don't see where you can do that, it goes in one ear, becomes something imaginative and out the other. And so what does it mean for us to not only say those things, but also provide real opportunities for students to experience that as we teach it. There may be a place for them to land to, to experience those things. That's the challenge I think that's before us today, particularly in, in low income uh, communities. Yeah, I'll jump in just real quickly and say, you know, I remember a colleague of mine, I was talking to him about Love the Lou and he said, and he, he's, uh, I believe he grew up in inner city Chicago and he said, well, you know, how are you going to talk kids out of joining the gangs? You know, when that's sort of a quick way to, you know, get acceptance and, and uh, how can you compete with that, so to speak? And so I went to Lucas and I asked him, I said, answer this question, you know? And he said, oh, it's not actually hard at all. He said, you know, kids have seen their, their older brothers g go to prison. They've seen their cousin get shot. You know, they, they don't want that for themselves. The reason that they end up in that place is because they don't see any alternative. And so once you come in and you've got even just a few people who are living right on the street, succeeding, like Tawana, right? Living in a beautiful home, serving her own community, now all of a sudden it's a vision it's it's the imagination of the child that is now fired right and able to see where things might end up but it can't that's why i want to go back to my original point that some one size fits all sort of program doesn't accomplish that right it's it has to be something person to person where this kid is living down the street from someone that they can emulate and uh, I think that's right. I think that's really, truly all it takes. Okay. We have a, we have a school in South Tucson uh, called San Miguel. And it is the, it's exactly the kind of school where you would expect a very low, crime, low graduation rate. You would expect uh, many of the students, uh, mostly Hispanic, some black, uh, very few white. You'd expect them to, many of them to end up in gangs, end up in jail. 
Uh, in fact, they have basically 100% of their students go to college and graduate from college as well. So um, now this is very much a matter of local investment and very labor intense commitment. Uh, what kind of lesson do we, are we supposed to learn from that? What, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think part of what uh, Anthony was warning us about is in effect, uh, be careful about finding a formula for success and thinking you can scale it up. So I don't wanna jump to any conclusions there, but, but I, I do wanna say, don't we know something? Uh, don't we know something about how to build strong children? I mean, we, we do it in some places. Why don't we do it more widely? Yeah, this is, this is a, a fantastic question. I'm, I'm so glad it was asked. Uh, there are there are inner city schools in New York here in Chicago that have the exact same graduation rate. They have the exact same college acceptance rate. Here's what's different. Um, they are they they tend to be uh, single sex schools, right? All boys inner city school in Chicago, 100% graduation rate, 100% um, uh, college. Uh, acceptance rate. And, and, and that really speaks to thinking about all of the variables that lead to, to, to education success. Uh, in Hispanic communities, uh, you're going to have lots of variables that make the contributions to education success, like the support of, of family systems, right? Parents, grandparents, cousins, aunts, uncles, etc. Uh, involvement in in local uh, civil society institutions, uh, uh, et cetera, and even even I'll, I'll say this even in the black community, what you find is it is that outside of of parents, the second greatest predictor of education success in urban areas is participation in local churches. And why is that? Why is that? Because because the children are supported by a community of people who are who are checking in on their education success. And I'm, I'm in a black church in Harlem. They have an education Sunday every year. And we celebrate everybody who makes an, who makes an advancement in grade. Like a second grade child gets 200 people clapping for her and she walks up front and gets a certificate. So, so whenever you have entire communities that are supporting children and their education advancement, are you going to see those sorts of incomes? And my guess would be uh, in, that, uh, in, that, in that community at uh, San Miguel High School, it's not just the teachers and the kids, it's also the parents and other institutions that those, those kids are involved in that are all supporting their education success. And in inner cities, it's often been the breakdown of civil society institutions uh, that actually also undermine uh, economic success. When kids are on their own, not being supported by uh, networks of adults, when they're not being supported by, uh, you know, Boy Scouts, uh, churches, whatever, if they don't have those other institutions, uh, they, they tend not to thrive as well. Okay, so, um I want to ask uh, another question uh, from uh, um, someone who wants to ask about uh, redlining as a policy that's contributed to high levels of, of poverty. And I think redlining is a very big thing, right? But it's, uh, it's part of the policing problem that we talked about at kind of one, uh, one end of the continuum of childhood experience and uh, and what schools can be is another end of the continuum of childhood experience. And I, I guess I would think when it comes to uh, Ron's idea and Frederick Douglass's idea about building strong children, how much does that have to be about, um, say, um, teaching the kids that the world expects a lot of them, teaching them that, that 
the world thinks of them to, as being able to save a corner of the world, whereas what the police are teaching them, according to Patrice uh, Con Cullors, in effect, what the police are teaching them is not that they are the world's great hope, it's that they're a threat to the world. It's that the purpose of the police is to protect the world from them, rather than to protect their shot at growing up, to, to be able to carry a planet and a society, a church, whatever. Um, so, so is something like that at the heart of this? Uh, I mean, building strong children is uh, first and foremost believing that they're worth a shot. They're, they're worth their own best effort and they're worth their community's best effort. Uh, and this started out as a question about redlining. So if you can say anything about, it, are there forms of redlining that really just could be dismantled and we'd, we'd be so much better off if we did? I just want to jump in quickly with two comments and then I'm very curious to hear what Dr. Bradley has to say. Um, one is, and I'm repeating myself, but um, you know, another way that we send that same message that not anything is expected of you and, and maybe you're not capable of much is the way we've set up our philanthropic models. And I'm asking, I mean, it's a painful thing. If you are in a church, where you know your thing is to stick some stuff into a shoebox and give it to somebody for Christmas, and you're undermining dad, you know, who doesn't get to bring his kid a Christmas present by doing that, right? It's undermining his dignity. You've got to go back to your church and tell them <laughs> that the way they've been doing things is undermining of people's personhood and dignity, and they need to change their whole approach. Um, and so that's a painful thing for people to do, but they need to do it. And so it's, it's the police, but it's also us sending that message to people in the way that we, that we show up to them. Um, and then the other thing I want to say about redlining um, is that one of the, <laughs> I'm sort of repeating myself again, but one of the terrible legacies is the way that the school districts, I mean, we, we're already segregated. St. Louis is the third most segregated city in the country. There's a lot of racial pain in my city. And we're already segregated by real estate. And the, the market for education is the real estate market, right? So if you live in a certain neighborhood, you're stuck in that district. So I think if we look at why people are so in favor of educational freedom, even though it kind of goes against our political assumptions, it should be so obvious. This is one way of busting up the segregation that was imposed by redlining, is to be able to get out of that system. Yeah, those are, those are, those are uh, great points. I would, I would add just simply, and this, and I'm, this is something I, I stole from Thomas Sowell, so I, I won't even take credit for this insight, right? Zoning laws. Zoning laws, zoning laws, zoning laws, right? Zoning laws undermine economic liberty and opportunity. Zoning laws undermine, uh, they actually create barriers to entry for, for, for people to hear the message that you are the solution and that you can go solve this problem over there down the street. But then the zoning laws and, and all and some of the other ancillary agencies in some communities actually present, prevent them from, act, from, from doing that, right? So redlining on, on, the, on the political side is, is, has contributed to this, but also zoning laws uh, keeps our community segregated in, 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 in ways that actually don't make any economic sense. Uh, but also tend to increase uh, sort of uh, uh, inflate pricing and and block people out from from social and economic mobility and to your point to your point david it's not only that the that kids sh uh, should be told this but they also should not be told that the country's against them right and that's what makes my blood boil is that there's some students in some schools who, are, who get the message that the country is against them and that, 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 that America is nothing but uh, uh, a country of, of obstacles and that no matter what they do, 
the system is actually going to work against them at, at every move. And so there's a bias to, act, to, to sort of pushing through uh, what, what may have been sort of considered kind of normal life obstacles because they assume that that obstacle is something that's, that's against me. And, and during the Jim Crow era, you sort of didn't hear this sort of rhetoric, right? You sort of knew it was hard. You knew the world was, was not a, a fair place, but you know what? I'm gonna do what I, what, whatever I gotta do uh, to take advantage of all the opportunities that I can take advantage of to take care of myself and my family. And that's, that's what I, I really want kids uh, to, to uh, uh, embrace but we got to take care of these zoning laws uh, so that, so that uh, entrepreneurs can actually create opportunities right down the street uh, without having to go through a zoning commission to get permission uh, to do that. There's so many small businesses that local people create in their own communities to take care of their own families, but they can't do it because of zoning laws and, and all sorts of, of regulations like that. Okay, interesting. Thank you. And I guess uh, one of the ways my understanding is that I think uh, the case of Euclid versus Ambler Realty was a case, that was a case where uh, zoning laws uh, started to become uh, legitimate and accepted. But before that, they hadn't, they, they'd always been ruled um, illegal and I think even unconstitutional because they were thought to be vehicles of racism. And it sounds like what you're saying is that original uh, concern was not totally out of line. Um, so uh, what else, Ron, did you have any reaction to that? To the uh, redlining? Uh, yeah, to the uh, to the redlining idea or the uh, more uh, positive idea, I guess that there uh, there actually you know are obstacles. Everybody has a hard life. Everybody has a hard childhood, but uh, but there are uh, but some people, some kids face much worse obstacles than others, and uh, and maybe redlining contributes to those obstacles and then and then the question is what can you tell a kid despite the obstacles to say hey giving up is not a legitimate option here your church believes in you your school believes in you your neighborhood believes in you your parents believe in you your siblings believe in you get on with it you have great you have greatness and you get on with it yeah well you know what to me what you just described is two things, servant leadership and mentoring. And I think that there are a lot of young people in our communities that need strong, responsible mentors uh, to provide them with the guidance that they need to overcome these obstacles. Because like Anthony said, many of these obstacles are not unique to race or gender or ethnicity or religion. They're obstacles that we all face as human beings. But if you do not have a responsible adult in your life, whether it's someone in the church or an ex uh, extended family member or a parent uh, to give you the support, the love, the direction and the guidance you need to get through and overcome those obstacles, then you're in trouble. Was it Winston Churchill who, who said, when you're going through hell, keep going? Um, you know, you need to have someone motivating you and pushing you because as a child, <clears throat> you're not just going to get it. You're just not going to overcome by yourself. And um, it, yes, it's a hand up, not a hand out, but uh, we need more bridge builders. And so um, not only do you have Frederick Douglass, his quote regarding um, the um, um, building strong children, but even in the Old Testament, Proverbs 22, six, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. So we have um, um, a responsibility as servant leaders and as community members uh, to pour into our children, to support our children, regardless of their race, ethnicity, gender identification, sexual preference, or religion, 
to assist them and to help them overcome these obstacles. And, uh, you know, he's talked about the educational system a few minutes ago. There are certain communities where uh, those cities, municipalities, and states spend 10 times more money on incarcerating than people than they do educating people. So right there in those communities, it tells us their priority is incarceration, not education. And I'm sure Anthony, uh, if he's not written on the, the school to prison pipeline, I'm sure he's heard that term before. And in, in some places, that's a real problem because the focus of the resources is not in education and not in building community, but incarcerating people. And like he said, without alternatives to incarceration, and as Rachel said, without that, the, without neighborhoods getting involved in the local level, then we've pretty much left our children uh, vulnerable um, to a number of different nefarious individuals or obstacles that could definitely change their tra trajectory for the worst. So it seems to me that there's a, there's a link there between the uh, optimistic and the uh, pessimistic sides of this. Uh, Anthony, uh, one of our uh, listeners has a question for you. It says that you talk about remedies for allowing poor people um, uh, to thrive and flourish, um, but asks, is how possible is that in a society with a mindset that doesn't uh, allow or, or at least, you know, constantly wants to deny people who look different uh, from us to thrive. Uh, so let's, yeah, I, I think, uh, I think you, you know, you know what the person is, uh, is getting at. So there's a, there's a constant, um, like I said, I, I, um, uh, I think this, I mean, I grew up poor, uh, but growing up, I don't think growing up poor and growing up a member of a minority race are the, are the same thing. Um, but, uh, but it is true that if you don't have information, if you don't have encouragement, that's, uh, that makes, that does make a world of, of difference. So, so what, what do you think? What does it, what does it take? I mean, so you might say, uh, we're talking about, there's a mindset of, you know, people prejudiced against people who look different. Uh, is that the only threat? I mean, in my case, my parents, they didn't even know what a university was. I found out when I was 11 that there was such a thing. Uh, and so it isn't that there was anybody actively working against me. It's that there was no information. Uh, there, there was, you know, if there was such a thing as a ladder of opportunity, nobody knew what it was. Nobody knew where it was. And, I, you know, I still found it. It was still okay for me. Um, but you could imagine if I'd been bullied by police, that that might have broken the camel's back. So, um, so is there something, I mean, is, is, can we take that premise on board and say, okay, if we have poor kids growing up and they're growing up without optimism, the people who, the authority figures around them are not, optimi are not optimistic about them, are not encouraging them, uh, is there something that can be done from whatever level, at a church level, at a state level, at an educational level, is there something that can be done to, to reach down and grab those kids? I don't remember who uh, did this study. Maybe one of our readers can tell us about this study. But somebody said that he, uh, he had gone in and done IQ tests at the, at the eighth grade in the poorest schools in the country or in LA anyway and he said in the poorest schools in LA two percent of the kids showed up as being in the top of the two percent of the population so two percent of those kids were genius IQ and uh, and then he said hey extrapolate there's like a million kids in the country yeah. who are geniuses in poor schools poor neighborhoods uh, depressed neighborhoods and by the 12th grade 
they're disappearing. They don't, there's no 2% anymore. They're pretty much gone. They're in gangs. They're protecting themselves. They're, they're concealing their intelligence. They're deliberately failing. They're forgetting what success would be like. They're forgetting what aspiration would have been like. Uh, but if you could get them in the eighth grade, uh, and then this person started up from uh, schools for basically eighth graders from poor schools who test in the top 2% of the population. He was going to be starting up schools like that. I don't know what happened with that or with him, but it was, uh, it was an incredible thing to think that between the eighth grade and, and, uh, and the 12th grade in this country, it's like uh, a million geniuses are disappearing. Mm -hmm. Like you, you can't, you know, you're throwing away the potential of your culture if you throw away a million geniuses every year or something, whatever, whatever the period was. Um, so, so, I mean, there's a vested in that, like everybody's got a very, anybody who believes in humanity has to believe you got to find those million geniuses and tell them they have no right to quit. They have no right to join a gang. Yes. Yeah. And, and I would, I would, I would also add um, that you also that we also need to be vigilant at removing the obstacles that produce those barriers for them to enter into social and economic mobility. Right. So they absolutely need to have imagination. I think Ron is exactly right. Like they have to have guides and coaches and encouragement. Uh, but they also need to have opportunities. And I think this is why really basic things like the rule of law and property rights and economic liberty and entrepreneurship and things like that, those are the sort of equalizers that, that allow children to have aspirations and imaginations for their future and actually, and actually allow them to actualize them. There's a great magazine called Black Enterprise Magazine and that magazine has done an amazing job of telling these stories, telling the stories of black entrepreneurship and raising up generation after generation after generation of, of, of business leaders uh, from all aspects of, of the of black community. One of the tragedies of this, one of the, I'll say it this way, one of the unintended consequences of desegregation is that the black middle class uh, lost its, its, its proximity to uh, the black underclass. And when those communities were in close proximity, uh, David, the, the information was transferred uh, because you had the middle class and the lower classes sharing the same social spaces. And so you heard about college, you heard about businesses, you saw them, you saw, you saw black doctors, you saw, even if you were coming from a poor family, you might be delivering a newspaper to a black doctor and be amazed and think, I wanna be like that someday, and how do I do that? And all of these interests in the community did that. And because, as Rachel said, we live in these hyper-segregated communities by social class, that sort of mixing uh, doesn't happen and people don't even see, they don't even have the, they, their, their imaginations aren't expanded because they don't see people like them in those, in those other spaces. I'll give you a quick example of how I, I mentored a kid uh, and, and, and sort of rocked his world just by letting him hang out with me. So uh, there was I, was, I was living in Grand Rapids, Michigan at the time, and there was a kid whose dad was in prison. And he was in eighth grade and was already on his way to prison. He was, he was a, a very, very a successful drug dealer. He was so successful, his mom was stealing his drug money. Okay, he was really, really good. And his eighth grade teacher asked me if, if, if I would just hang out with him. And we would go to Denny's and I would just let him eat tons of food and we would just talk. And then, and then there was one Thanksgiving where I took him with me down to Atlanta where I grew up and he sat down with my family and had Thanksgiving dinner. And that was the first time he had seen right in his life um, my father on the one end, my mom on the other end, and a bunch of our siblings. It was like a Norman Rockwell painting, but, but it was all black, right? And then we put him in a car and we drove him around these communities in Atlanta and we said, these are all black communities, right? And these homes were 
three hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollars, right? And he, I saw his eyes. They just and he, he, his eyes just exploded, and 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 he was on fire at that point, right? He wanted to go to college. He wanted to start a business. He wanted to to start a a, a sports league in his in his town. He was he was you know, he sort of came alive just because he saw something he had never seen. And he had never seen people who look like him do things that he thought that's only for those uh, people. Uh, those, th those opportunities and those things are the things that sort of white people do. Right. And so, and so just having that imagination for him really made a difference because he could see it. We encouraged him. And he can, and it basically, basically changed his life. I mean, those are the sorts of, of things that happen when, when that proximity is eliminated and people who have the social capital and have the financial capital actually roll up their sleeves and get involved in the lives of people uh, who, who need their voice, their mentorship, their, their education, their imagination, and the kinds of information that you said uh, you got when you were 11. We could do so much. We have so many gifts that, that we don't realize we have, but we actually just spent some time being with people. We don't have the, oppor the same opportunities and access that we do. Thank you very much, um, Anthony. And Rachel, before we close, I wanted to give you one opportunity to um, say a few words, if you so choose, um, before Dave... Um, um, sends us home for the weekend. Well, <laughs> I don't want to sound um, crude, but you know, when I was listening to Anthony's story, I couldn't help but think, you know, what's our attitude towards that eighth grade kid? Surely our attitude could be, wow, we've got a real problem kid here. Or we could say, boy, this kid's got some business savvy. You know, this kid's got some talent. And so part of it is also the perspective that we have on people that we're talking about, right? Are we looking for their talents and their gifts and what they have to offer and then saying to them, I want to exchange the thing you've got because I want it and give you something in exchange and inviting them into uh, the life of commerce that we all enjoy. Uh, so anyway, I just couldn't help but think that when you were telling that story, which is such an awesome story, and, and exactly what, what uh, Lucas would say about the work on, on Enright, which is, you know, look, having a, a house that's being fixed up, see, having somebody you know move in, having beautiful gardens in your community, you being the one who planted them, right? That changes a person from the inside out. And it's, it's not a matter of needing necessarily more resources and time invested. It's a matter of taking the resources and time we already do invest and doing it in a different way, uh, in that relational focused way, as opposed to the way we're doing it. And I'm just saying to anybody who feels compelled by the case I'm trying to make, this will be difficult because you'll have to rethink the way that you spend your philanthropic dollars and the way that we incentivize uh, both our governments and our charities as to how to handle these situations, so. Thank you very much, Rachel and Anthony. It's been an honor and a pleasure uh, serving as your moderator. I learned a lot today. Um, I believe I'm a smarter and better person as a result. Um, Hopefully my hair might even grow a little bit as a result of this. <laughs> Who knows? I can be a, I can be a wishing man, get a hopeful man. Um, but Dave, is there anything that you would like to uh, share with, uh, with our participants? Uh, I guess I will just say uh, this is one of the most important topics of our time. And it is a it is a topic that it's uh, it it's emotionally extremely stressful to uh, to talk about and to risk talking about to risk sharing your thoughts and your feelings. 
uh, and I know uh, that you've actually, I, I've known all of you for a while now, uh, and I know that you've been uh, walking the talk for, uh, for a very long time, and, uh, and uh, yeah, if I could scale anything up, it would be you. But, uh, but in lieu of that, I, um, uh, I thank you for all of the uh, people that I know that you've talked to over the years, that seen you talk to them, um, and uh, and and gone home knowing that you made the world a better place. Um, so uh, whatever you can do, uh, maybe we can't scale you up, but uh, we uh, we got you in front of uh, a fair a fair number of people. So I think that's a that's a that's a good thing, and I hope uh, I hope we can all. Uh, learn something from reflecting on uh, on where you've been and what your trajectory is and what what success can look like um, because uh, yeah this isn't over um, and yeah progress is possible this is not a zero-sum game um, and uh, yeah, and we're, uh, yeah. Where are we going to be in a generation ago? Well, uh, a generation from now. Let's uh, let let's figure that out. Let's uh, let's empower some of our young friends to uh, to carry on from here. So, thank you very much for joining us today, and thanks thanks for being part of our lives. Yeah. Before we leave, um, I just wanted Dr. Bradley to share with us. I know we spoke briefly about one of the books that you currently or one of the books that you've published you currently have a book that um our participants can have uh, can purchase or would have access to or download or get on kindle yes for i believe less of less than twenty dollars uh, on sale is uh, my book uh, ending uh, mass incarceration and over criminalization and it covers uh, basically all the topics that we covered today you can get that book on amazon it's cambridge uh, university press and by the way there is a chapter on the school to prison pipeline there's an entire chapter uh, on that question there's also two chapters on alternatives uh, to incarceration on the ground in local communities and the sorts of things that states are doing as well so it's a comprehensive book that really covers much of the topics here it's ending mass incarceration and over criminalization. Thank you so much. Excellent. Um, Rachel, do you have any speaking engagements coming up? Um, I don't necessarily, but I'm, the reason for that is because I'm finishing up uh, the rough draft of the book that I'm working on called Black Liberation in the Marketplace. And so I'm hoping that that'll be out next fall so you can keep your, your eyes open for that. Excellent, thank you. Congratulations <laughs> to both of you. Thank and you I have a, for having a prime, us. I have a Prime Video membership, so if uh, if anybody would like, uh, I I can uh, uh, Prime you know Amazon Prime membership, so I can uh, I can send you a copy of that uh, book too if you uh, if you send me an email, uh, and also I can send you a copy of Rachel's book uh, when it comes out if you if you want to send me an email and uh, and make sure that uh, you're on our uh, mailing list. So, thanks. Dave, are there any other events coming up soon um, that the, uh, the center, the foundation will be hosting that we wanna share with our guests and our panelists before we depart? Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, Dan Asia and Robert Gordon host uh, a program called uh, uh, Voices of Culture. And this is, uh, this is an episode in that Voices of Culture uh, series and we have uh, a number of guests coming up in the fall. So, so I would encourage you to uh, look up Voices of Culture at the University of Arizona. Uh, you can get to it from the Freedom Center webpage. Uh, you could probably get to it with a direct search for Voices of Culture, or you could get to it uh, by searching on the page for uh, American Culture and Ideas Initiative. Uh, so there's any number of places to get to it, but if you go to Voices of Culture, that is uh, 
that is a pretty robust ongoing uh, speaker series with uh, with uh, you know some fairly uh, some fairly eye popping uh, uh, speakers such as yourselves. Thanks for that. So with that being and said, you thank can, you. Yeah. You can see Robert posted uh, his uh, his uh, uh, ACI the ACII uh, landing page. So before uh, before we log off, you can grab uh, you can grab that email if you like, and that that'll get to us. Yeah, and if I could also just jump in to say thank you to everyone for showing up who's still here. Um, yeah, the links to subscribe to our mailing list are in the uh, chat box as well as the Voices of Culture link. Um, we have, uh, yeah, we have another seven uh, people lined up for the year and we'll all be doing these Zoom events. So this was kind of a dry run. We're kind of getting used to our custom, the Zoom uh, format, but we will uh, have music uh, available uh, prior to each of our talks that we come, uh, that subsequent talks. Uh, and we look forward to, you know, I'll get all your emails if you uh, subscribe. So I will uh, let you know uh, of all the events that take place. So thank you very much uh, for everything, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe, everyone.